Hi, my name is Dr. Manuel Waldmeier. I'm a trained specialist in oral surgery from Kassel, Germany. Today's topic will be on the German way, what should the dentist change due to COVID-19? And the second part will be on the implantology after the shutdown, the autologist concept with the Anyridge protocol and the Anyridge um, implant. I'd like to thank Mergen and Meinek for giving me the opportunity to talk to you today. As you may or may not know, German dentists were forced to have their offices open during the whole time of crisis and we had some time to implement uh, some new aspects in our offices for our staff, our patients and ourselves to reduce the risks of the COVID-19 virus. So during the first uh, half hour, uh, I'd like to show you some aspects what we did and I would like to show you some aspects which probably could be done uh, in the near future in order to improve on uh, the risks reduction. In the second part uh, of this lecture, we're going to talk about uh, our way of how we derive bone graft from an extracted teeth and use it in our autologist orto concept with the Enrich protocol. So let's get started. What to do? As far as I do understand, most of the offices worldwide have been closed. And um, in Germany, due to uh, our dental law, we weren't uh, able to, f uh, to close our offices. So um, the offices had to be open for emergency treatment. A couple of weeks ago, uh, we all were in the phase of denial. Uh, we thought that this virus will never affect our uh, way of living and will not uh, infect the way we uh, run our offices. Then there was resistance where we all said, no, it's not going to affect us at all. Um, we can continue to work, but we saw that uh, this um, virus uh, really became a worldwide crisis. Right now, in Germany, we are in between phase three and phase four, the crisis and the exploration. Exploration for us dentists means that we have to look for new ways of getting our um, patients back into our offices um, to reassure that they feel safe and that not only they feel safe, but also our staff feel safe and turn the situation from the exploration into a phase of acceptance. In German dental society, uh, we talk about the new new. So um, right now I'd like to show you some of the steps we did in our office. But before that, I'd like to um, get some uh, words from uh, Dr. Park uh, on this slide. We all should change the way we uh, should act from homo sapiens to homo empaticus. We not only have to show sympathy and compassion, but we also show uh, should show empathy. Empathy for our patients, for our staff, and also for our um, dentists who work next door. We're all in the same boat, and we have to uh, work together to get out of this crisis together, safe and sound. So don't see your um, fellow dentists as a competition in this crisis. Go locally, go talk to, to your dentists uh, next door and see what you can do as a dental society. So uh, what our dental society did was uh, they provided us with a lot of information beforehand. And this is the one I think is the most important uh, because uh, it really saves lives. Um, it's actually just a sheet of paper hanging outside of your office door. It's a signage uh, stating that please read it before you enter the office. If you have any symptoms of the flu uh, or you had contact with a patient, with a person who uh, had a Corona uh, 19 um, exposition, please contact us first. Um, or if you have been to an area with a high COVID-19 contamination, and contact us first means please phone in. And what we did and what we saw is that you have to have the signage both on the practice door and the front door so that the patient actually passes through and see it at least once so that he cannot miss it. So once he enters the office, um, we actually did a lot of change in the reception area. Um, if a patient comes in, normally he handles uh, our uh, stuff, his insurance card, and this insurance card has to be put in a card reader. 
now we repositioned this card reader on the office desk and um, have put and we put a disinfectant solution right next to it so that every patient who comes in first of all disinfects his card put in the card in the card reader and mandatorily uh, disinfect um, his or her hands as well if he has to dial on the card reader we provide q-tips those regular q-tips for the ear cleaning to dial the number on um, on the dial um, and he dis uh, disposed uh, um, the q-tip afterwards I understand that most reception areas are small so we also did something which is quite common right now uh, we mark the distance of 1.5 meters on the floor with adhesive tape Re the reception area is a place where we decide if we take a person inside the office or not if he's a routine patient um, right at the office door um, if he's inside we ask him for corona typical symptoms um, if he's free um, we go for uh, the routine treatment um, if he's not or if he's a high-risk patient we postpone the uh, um, the treatment for 14 days the difference between a regular patient and a pain patient is that the pain patient um, showing no corona symptoms is of course being treated but a corona 19 positive or potentially positive patient right now has two ways of getting treated um, the german dentist law states that if the if you have uh, if you are an emergency call and a covid 19 patient calls you in you have to treat him if it's outside of the regular hours you have to treat him if you're on call and if it's um, in the normal daytime w uh, the German Dental Society established some um, specific COVID-19 dental units um, most likely they are placed um, at the universities or at the city center um, hospitals um, where the COVID-19 patients are treated quarantine patients if they c call in um, are also um, um, giving the information to uh, c call in those areas to call in those um, specific clinics uh, for treatment so what did we change at the reception area we uh, not only installed those 1.5 meter marks on the floor but we also installed spit protection um, which also increases the distance between the patient and the receptionist um, the card reader um, and the um, solution for hand disinfection is put on the side of the patient and uh, also we mark a uh, one meter distance from the shield so that there is at least 1.5 meters um, before and after the spit protection for our receptionist um, this does not show our situation our receptionist is also wearing masks and gloves as well waiting room in the waiting room normally we do have a lot of magazines and a lot of uh, written information provided for an for our incoming um, and arriving guests uh, we now uh, took away all those um, magazines and we tried to get the surface uh, area um, as uh, smooth as possible so that there are no um, areas where we cannot use viricide surface disinfection Normally, we try to forward our patients immediately um, and we try to division them into the treatment rooms um, so that no person has to go into the waiting area. What we figured in this crisis is that most um, pa com incoming patients don't want to go into the waiting room. They uh, want to stay outside and they crowd the area of the receptionist. So what we do now is we take apart the appointments uh, so we have uh, much more space in between those um, um, at least five minutes, ten minutes between each patient. So there's just one or two patients inside the office at uh, every time being. Uh, if it's not possible within the room, uh, in the waiting room, you also have this 1.5 meter distances mark uh, on the waiting area floor and we do provide every patient who comes in who's not wearing a mask a face mask so he's or she is wearing a face mask uh, during the time of waiting in the waiting area or somewhere else in the office hand hygiene uh, we don't give our patients the hand for um, 
uh, saying hello and right now what we do is we do wash the hands when the patient is inside um, of uh, the dental chair um, normally I do it beforehand but now when the patient comes in I actually show him that my hands are clear uh, and washed and then I put in my glove and um, that's very important no beard is very important as well um, get yourself a good shave because if the facial hairstyle um, uh, interferes with the mask, the mask does not sit properly on your face and it's very important not to have leakage. Um, so a good uh, haircut and a good um, beard cut is very important. You may tell that the haircut right now is also a kind of a struggle in Germany. The barber shops aren't open yet, but uh, we are all able to cut our beards. Personal protective equipment. On the right hand side you see my staff and myself wearing uh, groans and wearing those DEY face masks, um, face shields, I'm sorry. Um, the face masks, as you can tell, those are just the regular ones. We now improved ourselves with the pure, with the PP3 and PP2 masks. Um, the problem with those masks are that when you wear it for a long period of time, you really feel yourself exhausted. Um, you cannot wear it for a whole day. Um, so I advise my staff to do um, something like this. Um, we do have three rubber bands, which we knot together in this way. And with those rubber bands, you can actually fit the... Um, you actually can fit the, the mask much better on the um patients uh, on the patient on, on your on your face so once the the regular mask is on you put in uh the the rubber band and uh you apply it uh, uh around your ear and you can tell that right away the um the leakage uh, of the of the mask is reduced to zero because it actually fits very very well on your surface on on your on your face okay so this is the first step the second steps are the shield um, which we actually glued on our um, protective eyewear um, what we also did is we DEY'd ourselves um, a, a 3d printed um, frame for the shield I'm, I'm aware that those plans are um, available at um, the Sinkiverse uh, homepage. So, if you're interested in that, um, it's very easy to download, and the files are open source. So, it's very pleasant uh, to use those because they don't stick to your loops, and um, the way of using them is very easy. Uh, so, what we do with the PP with the FFP3 masks um, before last Wednesday, um, it was allowed to um, temper the uh, mask was 60 degrees celsius for 30 minutes and it was said that this is sufficient enough but now um, the german society of dentists said it's not sufficient anymore so what we do now is we sterilize the mask when it's packed in uh, the gentle program with our uh, class b autoclave at 121 degrees celsius for 20 minutes before that if the mask itself um, is not clean we also put it uh, in the washing machine so we put it in the washing machine let it dry put it in a sterilized uh, package and then we put it in the uh, in the autoclave and then afterwards we check if the system of the the mass is still growing um, what's very important is to check afterwards and before if the valve is still uh, working properly okay Surface disinfection is also very important because the surface disinfection is um, something um, which is pretty um, easy to do uh, on all surfaces where uh, patients um, have contact to. I do understand that it's very difficult to get uh, those surface disinfections right now because not only uh, medical teams are using it but all other uh, shops are trying to get hands on those. So what we did was also to get um, the uh, uh, World Health Organization um, literature and we actually um, do our own surface disinfection right now so we mix it in our office very easy very sufficient very good to do 
What we also do is we use hydrogen peroxide. Before COVID-19, we asked every patient who came to them to brush his or her teeth. But now we actually give uh, them a 1% hydrogen peroxide solution, uh, which they rinse beforehand. Um, keep in mind, um, it's uh, quite aggressive. Um, they have to rinse uh, for 30 seconds and spit it out and um, maybe rinse afterwards with water uh, because it does not taste good. And it's, uh, as I said, it's very aggressive to, to the gum. But um, as Dr. Park stated beforehand, um, it seems to be very sufficient to reduce um, the viruses within um, the, um, the mouth. Impressions. Um, before COVID-19, we um, were very conventional, very conservative with impressions. We uh, took impressions uh, mostly. Uh, we didn't go for digital. Um, but if you have those uh, impressions um, and still stick to this conversional way of, of treating, get yourself a system which reliable uh, cleans them. Something like the Dyromatic system, which allows you um, to have a standard operating uh, protocol uh, for the disinfection and keep in mind to keep a lock, an analog or digital one, um, that you can tell that your um, material which you give to your lab is clean and um, free of COVID-19 or any other bacterial contamination. So this is something which uh, I really like uh, because my office worker um, also feel much safer uh, once the impression is cleaned. But talking about impressions, um, it will be increasingly necessary to do without the analog impressions. Instead of analog, we can go to digital quite easily uh, using a intraoral scanner, using the combination of the CBCT scanner uh, in order to plan our cases and in order to do the prostor as well within our own offices. So that's very uh, a good step. What about the extra all images? Of course, we can still take pictures. Personally speaking, I don't think it's dangerous to do this. Um, there's a, a very little amount of, of risk taking pictures, but is it really accurate? Right now, what I love is to do extra oral, extra oral face scans for um, the documentation because it's much more accurate than uh, the photos and it's um, once more you don't get too close to uh, to the patient so go digital whenever possible get rid of uh, anything analog try to do uh, the the digital way even while processing uh, the uh, the work in the lab we can go for uh, the vital articulator we can replace the conversional one because right now the accuracy of those articulators really improved in the last couple of years we see this uh, in our own prosto it's very um, accurate and it's something which you can um, get hands on right now you have some time to spare in your offices um, so this is something you should work on uh, in order to enhance um, the uh, capability of your digital work. Talking about digital planning and digital workflow, uh, of course we have to learn and get in touch with new software. And I would advise you to get into touch with the R2Gate uh, system uh, if you plan uh, your prosto and if you plan your implants work for it. <laughs> should be planned and carried out digitally. 
because it gives you the opportunity to really uh, improve um, the way of treating our patients. Now I'd like to talk about x-rays. In my office we took a lot of intra oral uh, x-rays examinations before COVID-19. But you know what? We actually um, don't do this any longer because what I figure is that the combination devices can really easily um, replace the intra oral x-rays. If we uh, take those uh, combination devices, we do have less uh, physical proximity to the patient and the staff, and we have less contamination with salvia. And we do derive the same information out of uh, those extra oral images, then uh, we can uh, go for the intra oral ones. So we do have the best image quality with a lowered dose in regards to a status, let's say. Um, there are a couple of new functions for uh, those extra oral images. Um, just to show you one, I'm a really large fan of the 3D low dose um, systems. Because with the low dose modes, you receive CBCT recordings in the range of a 2D recording. And so we don't need to have all those um, intra oral images. So this is low dose. What does low dose mean? We uh, have the opportunity um, to have a 3D image, 8x8, um, or larger or smaller, done with the amount of radiation as low as 3 to 20 uh, microsievert, um, which is very low, and it's, it's in the range of a normal intra oral picture or a small intra oral status. And we receive a lot more information to this. So, uh, my advice would be to go away from 2D to 3D recording within the same range of the dose. Talking about dentistry, what we changed is that we changed from a two-bottle system um, to a single self-etching system for most of the patients. Um, it's very easy to implement and your staff will also uh, be able to implement it quite easily once they know that there's only one step needed. Telemedicine is a growing concern right now in Germany. Um, there are a couple of uh, methods how we can implement telemedicine. Um, personally speaking, we tried it and we figured it's a good way of accessing if a patient is an implant patient or an implant case or not. And it's also a good way of getting people with anxiety to um, to take this first step to get to our offices. So we also have a lot of patients asking us uh, if we're capable of providing surgery for them. But apart from that, it's something which in my point of view is very difficult to implement as, as a dentist, but maybe in the near future, it's something which also uh, is something for our office. Um, so this is something which maybe is also enhancing the way of getting people to our offices. So now I'd like to talk about implantology. Um, this is Professor Dr. Dr. Knut Grötz from Wiesbaden, Germany. He's the president of the German uh, Implantology Association. And one of the major um, statements during the last couple of weeks was that there is no fundamental contraindication for scientific reasons not to implant during the COVID-19 times. So once more, there are no fundamental contraindication of scientific research saying we cannot go for implant treatment. So uh, what we did during the last couple of weeks is, of course, we reduced um, the, uh, the implantation uh, in our patients. We skipped and postponed the, the appointments, but now we're trying to get them back into the offices more and more uh, to get the implant done. Uh, what we f see is that those patients who ask for implants before COVID-19, um, they're very hard to get back to the offices because there is lack of money. They don't know what their own future will bring. So um, we see that some of those patients are dropping out. Um, so during the last couple of hours, I'd like to show you some new ways of maybe getting new patients to your office by implementing the autologous procedures uh, we use in our office. So we have to adapt ourselves um, with a new system and with new ways of thinking. 
And the AnyRidge system, uh, which we use for three years now in our office, uh, really uh, improved the way of how we do implant dentistry in our office. Um, some of the key aspects of the, the Megagen implant is the way it's designed for any ridge. Um, and it's very my personal um, way of, of thinking that this implant is very superior to, to others because of the knife threads, because of the condensation of the bone, um, the non-cutting edge um, um, threads that you really have a high uh, number of primary stability and the way of the platform switching um, at, um, the, at the junction to uh, the, uh, the prosto. So um, just to give you some uh, information on the system itself, uh, the double offset uh, is better for peri-implant biotypes. We really see in most of our cases that there are bone growing on the uh, surface area where the cover screw is, uh, we don't see a lot of uh, missing bone in this area. Um, because of the knife thread, we have a guaranteed uh, excellent implant uh, initial stability. And due to the round and narrow apical end, we uh, really seldomly see any kind of problems uh, with the Schneiderian membrane. The um, thread design is very important for um, the primary stability and uh, due to its design we have minimal um, shear force and we see that we have vital bones with, within the threads which is very important. Also talking about the threads um, it has a major, inf uh, major influence on the ICQ means so if we uh, see uh, the slide with with the ICQ changing over time uh, in the Megagen implant we see an improvement from primary to secondary stability uh, using the system and this is uh, unbelievable good uh, because now we measure the ICQ pattern and we can go for uh, the, the prosto much faster than we did before in comparison to other systems. Once more, the um, the surface area is a lot larger on the Megagen implant, and we do have um, the opportunity to use higher torque forces. With higher torque forces, we can go for easier and faster um, uh, prosto on 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 the implants. Um, what I like most is uh, the preservation of the cortical bone due to um, the um, way of the design in this area so that there is no pressure um, in this area applied. So now I'd like to uh, introduce to you uh, our autologous concept uh, which we do in our office since more than five years now. Um, the interesting part is that this is a tooth. Um, five years ago, I got into contact uh, with uh, this autologous procedures, and now it's one of the major key aspects of our office, uh, which we use with the Megagen implant. So let's get started. And talking about bone grafts, uh, why do we actually use bone grafts? Well, we use it in order to restore the natural bone and to regain its function and its aesthetics. One of the major aspects is that the bone sets the tone because without the sufficient bone quality, um, the potential outcome will be diminished or even compromised and fail. Before that, before five years ago, um, the number one indication for bone growth was um, implant stability. So we used it for lateral augmentation, sinus lift, fenestration. But ever since we go the autologous way, the socket preservation uh, right after tooth extraction um, turns to be the number one indication for bone grafts. Um, so what are the most important properties of a bone graft? Well, there are short and there are long-term functions. And for me personally speaking, it's a myth that the graft has to completely turn over. Uh, it can stay um, as a composite for a long period of time if it's a reliable scaffold, if it holds our uh, volume which we put in. And um, if it does it, uh, we have the opportunity to go for the implant on a um, uh, much longer period of time, so we don't have to go straight away. 
uh, the implant material, the, the bone graft material, has to be bioactive. It has to integrate within the um, the body of the patient. It has to enhance the body formation, um, vascularization, integration, and of course the communication of the cells. It has to be easy to handle, and of course it has to be minimal risks. Well, are there other considerations? Well, yes, of course, not all materials do have uh, the same good um, properties in every site. So there is um, a way the graft site actually um, plays in uh, the, uh, um, the, the choosing of uh, the, the material. Um, also, the age and the state of health of our patients is important to know. Um, it is important to know that it's medical list, he or she is in, if he's a smoker and a non-smoker, and last but not least, the doctor's skill sets and, is and her experience with a graph material. And more and more of growing concerns and growing uh, importance is the patient's consideration as to his or her realistic uh, and uh, religious way of thinking. Um, most people in Germany don't want to have dead cow uh, or dead um, pork inside of their bodies. So that's something uh, which uh, we have to talk to our patient. And of course, it's important to talk about the price. If something is derived from the patient's body, it's most of the time it's a lot cheaper if uh, it comes from a bottle um, from a company who wants to make money out of it. So what are the influence factors uh, regarding material selection, um, if we talk about graft material? If we talk about autologist procedures, of course availability is one of the major influence factors. If there's a lack of material within the OP sites, we have to go for a second OP situs. And then we have to ask the patient if he accepts this. Is the acceptance high for comorbidity or not? Um, what is scientific uh, documentation? How is the biological potency of the material? And how is the long and short term stability, which we talked about earlier? So what kind of materials are there? Of course, there are autografts, which are derived from the same individual, allografts from another individual of the same species, xenografts, which are from a different species, and synthetics. In my office, uh, we only use autografts and synthetics. Autografts we do harvest from the OP site itself, from the ramus, from the chin, from the tuba, and, which we'll talk about in a minute, from the teeth of our patients. Allografts, as to my understanding, are the most common in the US, are from donor bone, from mineralized or demineralized sources. Uh, xenografts, which are the most common in Europe, are from bovine or porcine uh, sources. Um, there are some from equine, algin, and from corals as well. And there are synthetics. I personally like the better calcium phosphate, um, but they also have known advantages and disadvantages. Talking about disadvantages, xenografts tend to be not to be very bioactive, and they can be seen as foreign body. They are mostly ceramic minerals due to the preparation process. Allografts they tend to resolve quite quickly, or they don't remain uh, the, uh, the maintain the scaffold sufficiently. And the reason why I don't like them in my office is the risk of prime transmission. So there is a short uh, or a very um, little amount of risk that there are primes given uh, from one um, um, from the donor to to the receptor side. So that's something which I didn't like to have in my office. Synthetics, well, um, they are either resolved too quickly or they remain forever. We all those know those pictures where there are islands of grass that they do look quite alieni alienly within the bone and uh, they tend to produce a lot of connective tissue and granulation tissue. So uh, some of those aren't ideal as well. Autografts are considered to be the gold standard but as I said earlier comorbidity and pain goes along if you harvest them from a second OP site and use if you use them solely um, they tend to resolve quite quickly as well and um, there are quantity considerations. So what about autologous teeth? Well of course they do require a tooth um, and tooth are, um, are limited in availability as well and they need processing and during the process something can occur and go wrong as well. So knowing all those materials right now 
what kind of material would you use in your spouse or in uh, your mother-in-law? I would say you would go for something which is autologous, derived from the patient's body. So one of the take-home messages from today is please stop to discharge extracted teeth. Instead, use them as the best quality autologous graft to provide superior aesthetic results for the patient. Right now in Germany, more than 13 million teeth are extracted every year, and so we missed 13 million times the opportunity to use this material for our patients uh, to uh, graft the side. And the interesting aspect about the tooth, which we will learn in a minute, is that we can use an extracted tooth no matter what time it is in the life of the patient. We can use it right away after the extraction or in 5, 10, 15, 20 years afterwards. So please, the only take home message is, which is important for today, use the extracted tooth to give to our patients so that he or she can decide later in his or her life to use it as his um, material for bone augmentation. So why can we use the tooth as a bone material? Because the cortical bone and the dentin are quite similar in its chemistry. Both do have hydro um, hydrogen appetite, collagen, type 1 and water. And something which I did learn from dental school is what is the anorganic pack in the uh, uh, collagen type 1. So there is um, some growth factors and some bone morphologic proteins within this um, material. Why is that? We all know ankylosis. Um, ankylosis is a pathological process where there is direct contact between the surface of the bone and the surface of the tooth with missing desmodont in between. So once the desmodont is missing, um, the osteoclast is able to enter the dentin area of the root and we see uh, those lateral resorption effects um, in ankylosis, uh, which we all know pathologically. So in this case, uh, with dentin as a graft material, we use this pathological process of um, um, resorption and we use it to treat uh, our patients for bone augmentation. So in conclusion, the dentin matrix, like the bone matrix, has the inborn uh, chemical and physical properties to attract progenitor cells and introduce them to generate new bone. Right now, there are three different systems on the world market, uh, which allows us to uh, use extracted tooth as a uh, graft material. Uh, today we talk about um, the smart grinder. Uh, which is more or less like a coffee milling machine and it allows us to have uh, four easy steps to uh, have a uh, teeth transform into a bacteria-free dentin graft. So starting with the extraction, whenever we talk about um, dentin graft we have to harvest as much um, tooth uh, as possible intact. So my advice would be the forceps are only used to remove uh, the prosto, to remove the crown, to remove the bridge, but not the tooth itself. So um, instead of using the forceps, I um, use the Lindemann cutter most of the time to, uh, to uh, get away the, the crown and then do a T-shaped -shape kind of drill in the upper molar uh, to remove the vestibular um, roots and then the palatinal one to keep not only the tooth but also the vestibular bundle bone intact and that's the way uh, to do it very safe and sound. After the extraction there is the cleaning. So if you have the tooth extracted this is how a tooth looks like, we all know this. Uh, we have those old fillings and um, some uh, d other uh, dirt material on, on the surface so we have to clean those uh, by using a high-speed uh, handpiece with with a diamond burr and after the mechanical cleaning we have to dry it and put it in the mill. After the tooth is um, inside the mill uh, we have some tooth material which has to be then chemically cleaned with a cleansing pr uh, process. It's a two-step process which can be done chair side um, which only takes eight minutes and what it do it will clean the area it will make it bacteria free and it will open up the pores and will um, 
also help to get the GF and the bone morphology proteins to uh, be on the surface so that the osteoclast can grab it and turn the dentin into bone. So we also use blood products in every single uh, surgical approach we do in our office. And this is one of the products I love the most, it's uh, the, the PRF, this one is from, from Joseph Chakroon. Um, it's um, a product which you will receive uh, using a centrifuge. Um, you don't need any external coagulation factors, your coagulation will take place will have contact with the tube wall. It's very fast products, um, it will only take 8 minutes at 1300 RPM with 200 G. Um, it's a protocol from uh, Ganati from the University of Frankfurt. Um, the only disadvantages of this method is it's very time sensitive. Um, if you miss the small corridor of one minute uh, to get the blood inside of the centrifuge. Um, you sometimes see that the PRF is not the way it should be, but knowing this, um, it's a very safe and easy protocol to implement in your, uh, in your offices. So what's inside of the PRF is um, a lot of uh, bioactive goodies, uh, bioactive molecules, which will enhance the ingrowth of uh, the soft tissue. So it enhances new blood vessel formation, the angiokinesis, which subsequently will need, uh, lead you to new bone and tissue formation. And it's a 3D matrix capable of supporting tissue ingrowth. Uh, the fibrin serves as a scaffold surface material. Cells, including the leukocytes, the macrophages, and the neurotrophils and the platelets, attract and recruit future regenerative cells and uh, will enhance the defect healing site. So it's a very good and easy way to uh, kickstart the healing process of whatever surgery you, you conduct. And that's the reason why we use it so often. We don't only use it with implants, we use it to in order to close and open sinus. We uh, have it inside uh, an extraction socket if we don't use uh, the autologous um, teeth as a um, substitute. Uh, we use it for wound healing. Uh, we have it inside uh, um, our um, sinus lifts in order to uh, cover the uh, perforation of a Schneiderian membrane. We also do it uh, without any perforation into the sinus and we use a foot gum drip technique so it's a very um, good system for going the autologous way. So talking about the autologous way, so how can we combine the megagen implant, the uh, autologous blood product and the autologous tooth um, in our daily routine? So this is a case I did um, in uh, 2019 uh, where um, the upper right uh, first molar had to be removed and the upper left first molar had to be removed but the patient decided only to have the upper right side uh, to be treated with an implant. So looking at uh, this x-ray we also see the source for the dentin graft which is um, the ideal source uh, because it lies there retracted and there's nothing um, on the surface area which we have to remove uh, apart from uh, the blood and um, the tissue. So um, before we start our um, implant um, protocol we uh, draw blood. In this case, uh, if we go for uh, a single implant, we draw between uh, four to uh, six tubes beforehand and we put it in uh, the centrifuge uh, with the protocol from Ganati, which I talked to you earlier. And this is the setup we see at um, the assistant side. Um, please keep in mind, never use the uh, scissor uh, re uh, to reduce uh, or to remove the blood from the PRF. The most important cells are uh, in the, uh, the buffy coat uh, area which is adjacent to the blood. So keep in mind, never cut this, this is the most important area. So this is the intraoral aspect of our patient. As I said, both uh, first molars had to be removed, so we started with general anesthesia and uh, the um, first step is uh, to get access to the uh, retracted uh, wisdom tooth. Then we removed uh, the prosto once more. Uh, the crown was removed uh, by the forceps, uh, but the tooth itself was not. 
instead uh, we removed uh, the crown and got access to the root. Um, the picture on the right side shows the most important instrument in my office. It's a, an instrument from Helmut Zepf, um, from Dr. Hildebrand, from, um, from Berlin. And I love it in combination with a hammer. It's a very easy way to minimal invasively uh, uh, extract the tooth and keep the, the bone healthy. So this is the site where we didn't want to um, put in the implant. And this is the other side. Um, you can tell that uh, um, you we can see the um, the crown of the rejected wisdom tooth. Between those pictures um, are 30 minutes. Very difficult to get uh, it uh, moving. And this is uh, the tooth after uh, the cleaning, uh, the cleaning process. It then put inside uh, the smart grinder uh, to get it milled and you notice that the amount of material you receive from milling a tooth uh, is quite large. It actually um, is larger than the tooth itself. It's normally between 1.2 and 1.5 times the size and volume. Uh, this is the uh, cleaning process and this is a ready uh, to use product which we will receive eight minutes afterwards right during surgery and um, as I said I love the Lindemann cutter Lindemann burr um, we use this in order to cut this t-shape um, inside of our tooth to remove the two vestibular and one palatinal root um, by doing so, we keep the vestibular bundle bone intact and we can also double check if it's intact or not. Before 2020, um, we weren't allowed to use the extracted root canal treated teeth for this procedure, but right now um, all the companies I know um, said that it's okay if we know the history of the, of the root canal treatment, so um, right now we would do this case differently, we probably would have uh, used uh, the extracted tooth um, themselves and not the, uh, the wisdom tooth only, but this is also a new way of treating, so keep in mind this is new and this is something which uh, is an option right now. So this is the side uh, where we want to put our megagen implant and you can really tell that this side is talking to you as a surgeon, it says go ahead put the implant in right away. There's a lot of bone uh, surrounding the implant. If we condense it or uh, using versa burrs, um, we can also move the bone. In this case, there is a, a sufficient amount of bones. So we didn't use versa. We use the standard um, Megagen implant um, drilling protocol for um, introducing uh, um, the, uh, the implant. And uh, in this case, what we did was we measured with our CBCT uh, the height of uh, the bone uh, interradically and there was a lag of uh, 2 millimeters, 2.5 millimeters. So what we did once more used a Helmut Zepf um, instrument. I know I'm kind of old fashioned using the hammer. I know that there are other ways to use it and to do it, but this is a way which comes in most handy for me. Um, we elevated it and then we put in our graft material and then uh, we placed uh, the, the implant. The graft material was only used uh, with uh, in the sinus lift at this point of time. The implant was then placed uh, using the um, handpiece. Um, keep in mind that on the package of the Megagen implant we see uh, an, a number which is one millimeter shorter than it actually is. So in this case we put in um, the implant on the same level as the surrounding bone. And then uh, we used um, the torque wrench to uh, put it in. As you can tell it's uh, 45 newton centimeters very high and we also double checked with our ICQ and the ICQ said 70 which is a very good value in this area. Once more uh, the knife threads um, of the Megagen implants provide us with the ability to um, don't have a drop from primary to secondary implant stability so this is the reason why we use it in this area so often it's the reason why we love it so much. Then we also put in the graft materials on uh, the surface area where the root was uh, or the roots were 
and then um, we always do it uh, to the same adjacent level as the surrounding bone. We don't overemphasize it. So this is how it looks like afterwards. And most of the time we would say we're ready now uh, to put in the sutures, just put in a PRF plug and that's it. But in this case we decided on also to put in um, a flap, uh, to make a flap um, for total closure because the patient wanted to go for uh, for a vacation uh, shortly afterwards. So this is what we did and we put in the PRF in there as well. Um, so this is how the situation looked like with PRF covered and this is how it looked like afterwards with sutures in it. And last but not least I'd like to show you the x-ray from this case and as you see the surrounding of the implant itself looks very very familiar to to most of us dentists because it looks like vital bone already so this is a step which i really love a lot um, to use autologous materials in order to enhance uh, the capabilities of uh, the megagen implant system um, it's very easy to conduct, uh, it's something which every dentist is able to do. Um, drawing of blood is also very easy, um, it's something which also your staff maybe can do, it depends on the area you live in. And I like the outcome of it, because all the cases do look like this or, uh, right after the treatment and right after the implant placement. So, thank you for your kind attention. In um, the name of Minec, Megagen and my own company Dentalect. Um, I wish you all the best uh, during this time of crisis. Please uh, um, stay healthy and I hope to see you all in the future. Thank you.